I'm good? Okay. All right. Hey, uh, welcome everybody. My name is Jason Grimm. I'm a consulting systems engineer with um, Cisco. And you are at the 201 walkthrough auto scaling OpenStack natively with heat, uh, Salometer, and Elbaz. Um, so join me or join with me today is uh, uh, Sharman um, Choksi and, and Shishang Shang, um, two of my partners, and they'll introduce themselves when they come up for their um, sections. Um, essentially, we're going to have uh, a quick introduction. We're going to go over um, how the workshop is organized. Um, we're going to go through with the environment setup, uh, background and use cases, services enabling auto scale, and then to the hands-on uh, portion of the lab, of the workshop rather. So about the workshop, I always think it's important to point out that um, we all work for uh, or with Cisco. Uh, however, this is not a marketing uh, workshop. Everything we're using here today is uh, free or open source um, software. It's where we put natively um, in the title uh, because there's not, uh, we're not using any external modules or, or plugins or, or, you know, touting one technology over the other. It's all native uh, OpenStack bits uh, using uh, DevStack as well. Um, we're going to try and get a WebEx up um, so that we can have chat and record the session. And, uh, you know, it, it, if you have questions, raise your hand on WebEx or physically. One of us will get over there and help you uh, out. Um, so here's probably the most important part. There's, there's three of us, and there's actually 561 um, of you guys. And I don't think not a fraction of those fit in the room, but um, very important that you collaborate with each other um, because it's good to learn you know, that way. And we're going to have, there's going to be issues. There's going to be issues that there wasn't enough bandwidth or the image didn't get copied over right. And, um, so everyone is probably not going to end up getting an environment. So someone in your vicinity should uh, have the environment or has more or less experience with VirtualBox or any of those things than, than you do. So please uh, reach out and uh, work with each other. Um, it makes it more interesting anyway and just for the general collaboration as well. So the um, content and schedule, uh, the first 30 minutes, um, we're really just going through some of the theory. It's good to, it's good to do, but uh, honestly, the, the first 30 minutes is dedicated to getting that environment uh, up and going so that we can do the lab exercises afterwards. Um, the bulk of the middle uh, is going to be the hands-on uh, workshop. And then at the end, um, Q&A and open discussion and, and close. So honestly, I'd like to have a full 60 minutes uh, in the middle. We can forego the, the end and get through this first 30 minutes as quickly as we can. Um, to the point of the build environment, when some of you came in, you saw the Vagrant screen already running. Um, so the process that we were, that you were seeing there um, is not the process for the workshop. It was the process that we used to build the workshop environment. Um, so the, this, this in environment on the DVDs and on the, on the USB keys um, that are going around is a baked, completed um, dev stack environment that's configured and ready to do uh, the heat and salometer and auto scale and that stuff and LBAS on top of it. Um, so the Vagrant stuff that was running, we put all the documentation out there so that you guys can can use that to, to build and test your own environments. But um, what you should be doing right now, like our, our, our biggest priority in the next 30 minutes is to get a virtual box image running on your machine that um, we can do LBAS and, and stuff on top of it. So just by a show of hands, where are folks in that process? Do you have VirtualBox installed? Do you have the image copied or you're doing Vagrant? How many people have an actual environment up and running right now on their machine? OK, one, no. Um, so if you're using the keys, um, pass them along. <laughs> if the, uh, the, the DVDs. Um, I don't know where at where they are, actually. So there's there's one, there's one. Oh, they oh they stopped. They stopped on the front row. So, <laughs> so keep, let's let's keep moving them to the back. Um, so a couple of callouts here. How many people have how many people are familiar with using uh, VirtualBox? 
OK, good, great. Um, the image, when I tested this, worked awesome for me because the image came off my box. So I took it off, and I put it back on, and everything was fine. But what we realized was that my networks were already set up. Um, and when you put the new image on, you, you have to tell it to give it the two host networks, and we have to give it the IP address of those networks, or the, v the image comes up and is staring off into space. So um, when you get the image on and you start booting it, and you're not familiar with changing the host network IPs, um, you know, give a yell, and one of us will, will come around. Um, that's it. You know, there, there's not. You know, we, we mount the media, grab the box, and boot the machine, and then we're going to be ready for the kind of fun stuff after that. So, that's what we have to get done in the next 30 minutes. Um, this is what is on uh, the USB keys. Not all of this fit on the DVD actually, but in the, uh, especially on the keys, um, you're going to want to grab at a minimum the the VBox uh, virtual B, uh, VirtualBox VM environment. Um, if you don't have VirtualBox installed, you'll need that. So grab your uh, flavor du jour, install that. Um, Vagrant and the repo copy, that's just for you if you want to do your own development or uh, mess with the Vagrant file or, or understand how the build process goes. Um, you can also git clone. Not everything but the image is up on git. Um, and if you want to just grab the uh, See that the I'm going to get the web thing. That's for the website, but you can double you get just the vagrant file as well. Um, so I'll come back to this. Um, so the environment, the logical ar architecture on the environment, um, it only took 29 or or 40 tries with Neutron to get it exactly right the way we we wanted. So um, it, any of you guys that have been working with Nova or Neutron know that the amount of configuration <coughs> settings are there. Nearly the same amount are in DevStack, except they're undocumented and, and a little bit <laughs> more difficult to figure out. So to get Neutron to behave exactly the way we wanted to be able to do flat file and um, the LBAS and, and things, we had to go with a, a fairly pared down configuration. So uh, Vagrant's going to create, or VirtualBox is going to create this VBox net zero. You basically don't want to mess with that. Um, leave that to DHCP. The, uh, and then there's VBox net one and two, depending on what those are named in, in your machine. 33, the 33.0 slash 24 network, that's going to be your API and management network. So SSHing into your virtual machine, um, connecting to the APIs, connecting to HTTP, and into CLI, all of the open stack and host OS, by host OS, I mean virtual host OS, the, 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 the OS of the VM you're running is on that 33 network. We, the second network, we tag it as 27.0. At the operating system level, it's going to be shown as unnumbered. Um, so it's going to be under control of uh, OVS, and it's going to use the, uh, the bridges for that. We did go with OVS. I I messed around with, with Linux Bridge and um, Docker and a few different kinds of interesting things, but it turned out to be just academic in, in the end because I'd, I knew OVS was working fine, and we had done that. Um, you may see, if you, if you keep up with the GitHub or anything like that, you'll, you'll see configurations coming out for some of the other things as well as Ironic. Uh, but for now, everything's pretty straightforward with OVS. Um, here's what the kind of a configuration example. So one of the things that Vagrant does um, after it builds the machine, it goes through a pre-requirement uh, uh, process where it creates uh, accounts and keys and things like that. But one of the most important things it does is configure local.com for us, um, turns off the services we don't need, turns on the ones that we do. Um, Pretty much the core services, plus um, heat and solometer, and then uh, neutron, which uh, um, w w minus the firewall and VPN, uh, but essentially everything else. Um, here's a stanza about just the new neutron configuration and how the bridge adapter is is connected. There's our kind of software stack over there and the uh, IP addresses and um, the services that are turned on. So. Uh, stable Kilo, this works with master um, as well, or like the latest um, cut, but for stability, I, I, I left it in Stable Kilo for the, for the workshop, but should work fine with master as well. Um, the build process that some of you guys were looking at, 
there's essentially three um, within the Vagrant file. Um, well, the dev Vagrant file, the one that you're using is pretty, that's the wrong uh, button. Um, you can do a base OS install, you can do a staged install, and again, what you're, what is the image that you're getting is what we're calling the complete install. It's got everything installed um, and staged, our, you know, the, the base configuration, the keys, security groups, the routes, uh, all that stuff is there, as well as some heat templates and some salometer alarms created. Um, but the process is, you know, create the machine, install the OS, dev stack pre-install, which is groups and IP tables and, and syscontrol, and uh, if you're going to do this again, here's a, a good call out. I, I had much better success pre-staging the OVS switch configuration with the, at least just adding a uh, physical adapter and the switch. Um, when DevStack did it, I had like a 50-50 shot of whether it was working or not. Um, install DevStack, post-install DevStack, basic stuff with the uh, key security groups, DNS, and then uh, finally the advanced uh, DevStack stuff, which is really just creating load balancers and um, adding members to pull and creating VIPs just for testing. Um, it doesn't do all the lab exercises for you, you just want to verify that that stuff works. And then uh, at the end it, it snapshots um, the VirtualBox VM for you. So status check, how are we doing on people who are doing manual Vagrant up builds from scratch? Did the wireless completely fall over? Anyone who's copied the image over? Are we getting the images up? Now, yeah, the, the, ne network settings. Oh, the network settings. Can someone help him with the network settings? Yeah. So, if you have to redo the adapter for uh, network two and three, um, it would be the management IP on uh, the second adapter, and uh, um, you can leave the sec third adapter as is. Do we, can you just uh, scroll down to the yeah? So adapter one, uh, two, the, the first one is a NAT only. I'm sorry, it's a NAT, NAT network, and the second and the third are host only. So the second network adapter needs to be configured with uh, 33.2 IP, and the, the last one is uh, uh, 168.27.1 network. So it's a 33.1 and a 27.1 for uh, each of those. Yeah, sorry. So the um the 33.2 is already in the image. Um, that's already statically IP'd. What you don't see up here is the the VirtualBox hypervisor side that it calls that 33.1. Um, and then, so when you when you're configuring the networks on that image that's imported, make the first one 33.1, uh, and the the second one's actually 27.1. Um, but I don't think it's as important. Actually, it, it is important because the VMs we're going to be connecting to those VMs, so make that yeah twenty-seven point one. What is the username and password? Um, it is everything is stack, so it's root stack and vagrant stack, and in open stack it's admin stack and demo stack. Um, stack stack is the password. Username is stack and the password. No, the to are you SSHing in? So SSH, you can do a couple ways from the console um, that you, you know, well, sorry, if, you, if you're if you with the image, use Vagrant and stack. If you had built from Vagrant, you can do Vagrant space SSH, but if you're using the image, just connect with Vagrant and stack. Um, I should have had a whiteboard or something, um, but Vagrant and stack. Any... This is the most important thing is getting the build going, so let's spend a minute. How are we doing on the time? Hours. Thank you. Okay. So machines up and go okay. Zero, zero, 001 did you build from scratch or using the image okay um, if you built from scratch you want to you want to SSH with the uh, 33 dot two so you're gonna do you need to make sure you have the right network config uh, on the uh, virtual box 
And uh, you may notice that the second one, uh, the first one is NAT, the second one is on 192.68.32.0, right? Slash 20, yeah. So you can try to SSH into the virtual machine by the 192.168.33.2 IP address. You can try 33.2, or the, if you're in the folder that you launched Vagrant from, you can just type Vagrant space SSH, and it will, if everything worked correctly, did that work? Did it connect? A while to come up. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Let's. Yeah. Can we start the WebEx meeting? Um, Using yours, right? Yeah. So mine. Mine's sitting at uh, Clinic Neutron Elbaz, and I don't know. If, is your so if yours is still going? You, yeah. You won't be able to. It does. It doesn't set up all the off until the the build is done. <laughs> Um. Okay. Go to the dev stack directory, and in that directory, you can find a shell script called rejoint. Dash stack to launch that uh, shell script. You should launch all of those your OpenStack services. This is dot slash rejoint. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. This is just dev stack should be. Uh, yeah. Well, did, did you did your um. I'm on WebEx, so if anyone wants to okay. join the. Um, for the. It's just the enter the, the room. If you want to just post uh, the room, the meeting, the meeting details, the room details. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. The the meeting details. Um, so vagrant and stack, uh, or or root and stack for that. Um, that's. Uh, so I think as long as uh, as long as everybody's got their uh, VM up, uh, let's uh, probably do that that checkpoint versus trying to bring up all the services right now. Uh, in the interest of time, I think because we probably might end up troubleshooting, uh, starting the troubleshooting process right now. Got it. And on the VBox image? No, I know. Yeah, I have not yet. Um, I will as soon as one of these guys takes over, which is in just a minute, then I'll I'll knock it out. What's uh, the username? S S C H O. Oh, just your S H O case. S C H O. Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, one more time. God damn, darn it! I just had it. Um, Webex dot. Cisco.com uh, meet. S C H. Okay, S C Y. Okay. So uh, the address, it's hard to read on here. Uh, for, for WebEx, for the uh, QA in the chat and the files, HTTPS colon whack whack webex.cisco.com. Uh, slash meet, I believe. Dot. Oh, si uh, I'm sorry, cisco.webex.com slash meet. And it's not going to be my room. Um, S C H O K S E Y. I know you guys can't see that. Um, Let's see. Uh, I have a one key thing so I'm going to point out. Uh, uh, several of you guys joined the WebEx, and there's a one error message when you try to import the VirtualBox into a uh, VirtualBox application. So in that case, please do not double-click the VBox uh, file. Instead, please create a new VM 
and uh, point the, the, the hard disk image to the VMDK file in the subdirectory. Everybody good with not importing the whole box? Create a VM and then uh, point to the VMDK. That's how VM to create, create a new VM and uh, use existing VMDK file in the subdirectory for your hard disk. Yes. It's a yes. The operating system is Ubuntu and is Ubuntu 64-bit. Um, single proc, four gigs of RAM. I would uh, turn off the ACPI and the and the BTX. Um, Yes. Uh, you'd have to specify. OK. I'm looking for the, oh, you know what I'll pull it up here. I can't make that any bigger. Um, so that, so it should look like the one that's being built by Vagrant anyway, so three NICs. Right, one, one NAT, uh, two host-only networks, um, four gigs of RAM, um, Ubuntu 64-bit, and uh, I think that's it. Right, and on the on the networks, so let me pull this. Uh, I got a whole bunch of networks, but on on you know the ones that you guys are working with, it should look something like this. Uh, whatever network it wanted to create, you should have one that says 33.1 and 255, 255, 250. This is the most tedious and least interesting portion of the show, so we, it's all right when we get into the uh, auto scale. It's going to be more exciting. But the the anybody having errors with the image? Does anyone have a working dev stack image running? Yep. Booted. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. You built from scratch. Yeah, yeah, from Vagrant up. Okay. You must be connected to some secret Wi-Fi that I don't know about, because mine's still taking its time. For the yeah, yeah, on the the first one's NAT, which it doesn't have to create, and then it's going to want two more, and and those host only ones. Uh, are going to the thirty three dot one is the, the first one and the second one should say twenty seven dot one. Twenty seven dot one, yeah, slash twenty four also. Well the first one is NAT. Should be an, should be the NAT adapter. And then the second, the the one after that is 33.1, and the one after that is is 27.1. Um, and you go to one, two, one, Yes. Um, this might this might help also. Um, um, This has flags in it, but you, you, I'll, I'll just put it back in VirtualBox. I mean, it, there's two. It's kind of hard because mine has a whole bunch of networks, but the two networks that come in with a VM, you're going to want one that says 33, 
uh, dot zero. And I mean, VBox net zero, they all get, which is the hypervisor's default NAT uh, interface. Right, yeah. And then uh, the, the second one's 27 uh, dot one. So you can probably, the gentleman next to you who. Oh, no. Oh, if you copied over the vagrant file and you did vagrant up, you don't have to modify anything. I don't have to modify anything. No. Um, that's, it creates the networks for you. Um, yeah. The Probably would recommend you not do right now. Use you know install from GitHub because it's not going to complete. Um, there's, there are some folks requesting uh, in more detailed steps on uh, uh, the GitHub installation. So let me just uh, outline it. So if right. you're going to do go the GitHub route, it's going to take longer. But if you still want to do it, uh, you may want to cd to the project folder and then go to environments uh, directory, which is where the Vagrant file is, and just uh, give a run a Vagrant up. It will install the image, configure the VM, and install DevStack from there on. Right. But those taking the GitHub route. Yeah, so there's a few of the folks that went figuring up from scratch when they came in like half an hour early. Any of those folks that are up and running, just ask them what the steps were. You just clone the repo or wget the vagrant file, and then go. No? It still hasn't finished. Um, right. It's it's. And that's why we did the image. I think we're kind of flawed on both routes uh, because it's tough to get the environment up that quickly, but it will eventually finish. Um, who, so there's keys. Yeah, just who, who needs a key? I would strongly recommend you use the keys. Just from a time perspective. You've got to mess with the networks a little bit, but. Say again? Uh, yeah, should be fine. Yeah. Um, re um, internal only will not let you. You'll have to be on the VM to. I mean, you're on your on the VM to do the CLI anyway. But if you wanted like HTTP to Horizon, although you can do a port forward, you know. Um, so you had used the image, did you copy the image over? Okay. Okay, and um, you just create the host only NICs and then put the right IP ranges on them? Did you do that? Okay. Right, right. It, it, it takes, I don't know why it does 60 seconds and it does 120. It will um, come up, yeah. Yeah, you have to have a, you have to have ETH0. You have to have a NAT network because um, all of the configurations in DevStack and Neutron and all the config files that are written are written using, uh, you know, ETH1 and ETH2 and, and references like that. And if you don't have that NAT ETH0 network, then you're not going to, the ETH1 and ETH2 stuff is not going to work. Uh, password to Horizon is going to be admin and uh, stack. All right. You have the first, you get. You should get like some kind of prize or something. You have the first working machine. All right. Fantastic. Um, admin and stack, and then you can change the um, project up in the corner to demo. Um, the stuff was built under demo. It, uh, not on the right, on the left. Um, so not the username, but the project uh, context. So did you do a vagrant up? I used 
use the image. Okay, and you got the and was that a fresh VirtualBox install? Like you had, didn't have anything else there before? Yeah. Okay. Um, so it seems like on fresh installs, it creates the networks for you. Um, not yeah, sure though. I just, well, I, no, I had to go in and I had to make uh, the step for each one. I also had to make a NAT network and then I just imported the image. And, well, I made a new box. And use the disk? disk? Okay. So maybe, maybe it would help if I actually just went through this on the screen. Yeah. Um, so, um, got it. So the, you guys can see that this is what a virtual box install. I happen to have one machine running. What I'm going to do is do a new machine. Call DevStack two. Linux, Ubuntu, 64, continue, uh, 4096, um, use an existing hard drive, um, and I'm going to go and find that drive, and it's going to be so. Everyone who's imported an image, this is all looking familiar. You have the VirtualBox VM on, on the key or on the DVD. Are the DVDs still going around? Does anybody really problem with that? Yeah, right. <laughs> I thought, I don't know, I know. Yeah, 2005 called and they want their laptop back. Um, so, right. So VirtualBox VM folder, right, dev stack. And then grab the drive. Um, see, mine not might not be a great example because mine, those networks already exist for me. Um, but if they didn't, host only, and I happen to know mine are eleven and twelve. You'll so that you just kind of. Um, Import, create the networks, and attach them. So whoever was stuck at CloudInit, did it finally uh, wake up and keep going? OK, good. So how many people have working environments now? Three-ish, four-ish? OK. OK. Um, if it boots without a message complaining about networks, then you did it right. Um, if it boots and says, I can't find this network that you'd have in the, because um, it ARPs against the, um, or it does a CDP against the NIC and the OS actually, and says it doesn't have uh, a, a route for that network and throws up an error. So instead of just standing here watching uh, you guys uh, build images, <laughs> um, I'm just going to finish off this section uh, and, okay, so it's the environment process. Um, so, uh, you know, what is, what is auto scaling? Um, so All of us, you know, all of us, kind of sitting here in this room are are a part of a, a very interesting time in IT history. So, um, cloud is, you know, probably the most disruptive technology since the advent of the the mainframe. Within cloud, OpenStack is even further disruptive in that it's open source um, and making a huge uh, wave like like Linux. Within OpenStack, um, aside from like. Service catalog and and uh, um, 
provisioning, provisioning and SDN and all that. You've got technologies like Autoscale and, and Bare Metal and Ironic um, and geobalancing and things that are even the tip of the tip of the tip, but I wouldn't call it the spear, it's kind of the tip of the grenade because um, it's, changing, it's changing everything. And it's, uh, it's a pretty interesting time for us in autoscaling. Some of you might have thought of or, or heard of these, these use cases. I don't know what your personal use cases are, but some of the projects I've been involved in um, are around academic and research, um, HPC, autoscaling. Internet 2, um, a, a, a funded entity, uh, almost like the relationship that DARPA had uh, with the Fed, there's, there's 10 gig and 50 gig and 100 gig pipes between Notre Dame and Clemson and UCLA now. So they're, they're doing MPI based and HPC based um, auto scaling over OpenStack um, across you know, geographies. It's, 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 a, it's changed everything. The, you know, the way that they do the research, they're not confined to the data center anymore. But um, media, uh, video and audio rendering uh, and hosting, of course analytics and big data, um, security, uh, I mentioned DARPA, uh, they, they actually have a public project now called Planet Nine um, where they're mapping every single circuit uh, in the US running on big data and running on top of OpenStack um, using auto scale to process data and model against uh, cyber attacks. So Fed, Pub, uh, there's use cases all over the place, but um, we have an idea of how it works, right? Instead of building, um, which is funny, it's more of an analog uh, flow than it is a, a digital flow. Um, instead of overbuying capacity, we're not having enough capacity. Um, utilize autoscale technology to to scale up and scale down when you when you don't need it. Um, another analogy is if you only go to church one day a, a year, um, don't don't build a church. <laughs> you know, don't. It's a poor it's a poor analogy, but they, <laughs> don't build a church for the one day that that you go. Go and rent it. You know, like it, you, you don't have to. Uh, through your money and time and, and resources. So there's certain, certainly cost savings, um, but what's more interesting than the cost savings is all the innovation um, and, and, and the way it kind of changes the way we look at, at technology, you know, period. Um, pretty basic components. You've got a server that's under load. You have a stress meter on that, on that service. In our analogy, or in our workshop, we're going to be using, um, Shishang will go into deep detail about this, but uh, it'd be Slumner would be watching a number of load, uh, connections against load balancers. And when a connection count exceeds a certain amount, it'd start spinning up um, web servers, and then it when it cools off, it'd be spinning those back down. So we have the meter, we have the alarm, there's an action, and then there's a, a server result. So the alarm could be hot or cold, up or down, right? And the action could be scale up or, or scale down. So um, it's a little... At first glance, it's a little bit complex under the hood, but in the end, it's just those, just those few actions. Um, so if you haven't worked with heat uh, before, uh, the way I think about heat, the way I look um, um, in, in my mind, so OpenStack is an extrapolation and orchestration and API control over, over all these physical assets um, underneath the, ho the host operating system, the OpenStack bits. Um, so you've got API control over um, switches and storage and um, VMs and networking and, and IP addresses and all this stuff. Heat is, if you take that same concept and put it above, primarily heat is controlled of the virtual resources that, um, um, that OpenStack has access to. But even that line is getting blurred because um, they're, you know, the driver for Ironic heat can leverage. There's, API drivers for, um, there's NetConf drivers for physical network and, and load balance devices. Um, so heat could really have control over, again, physical components. Um, it just depends. But in my mind, there's a layer of orchestration above and a layer of orchestration below. This, orchestra this below the orchestration that, that OpenStack does natively is really around um, provisioning and access control and monitoring who has access to what, where above it's more of a um, uh, workflow, more of an agile, um, you know, puppet, chef, um, uh, Ansible, salt kind of modality where it's actually taking the stuff that's consumed and then doing something with it, like building environments. Um, it was born uh, really to, um, like many open tech services, it was born to compete directly with Amazon's uh, cloud formation. Um, so at its inception, building environments uh, in cloud formation, and it still supports the Amazon um, syntax and the, and the APIs, but 
building a service like um, go and create you know, four web servers, put two on each network, create another network, put my app tier on that network and another one, put my database servers on there, plumb them all together, create the security groups, um, and deploy that as a, as a service. It's like a slam dunk for, for heat. The growth and kind of areas of interest around heat are doing, um, you know, L, you know, doing LBAS and doing, going further up the stack, um, and of course, auto scale and, and things like that. So it's a, it's a great, tool. It is the orchestration service. It's part of the core. Um, you know, where I've seen shops um, have issues is that they go half and half. Um, so if you have a shop and, they, and they're, they're doing 50% of what they need in Puppet and 50% in Heat, and then maybe someone else is doing another 20% in Ansible, um, that can get... Sometimes you have to do that because the functionality just doesn't exist. Um, I'm seeing a, a lot of people do orchestration outside, but um, you know, not a great use case to have Puppet call Heat when Puppet can just talk to OpenStack natively. So I'm not sure how you're deploying it today or what your interests are today. It's a solid native component, um, but it just depends on how you want to want to leverage it. Um, Shashan again is going to go into much more detail while you're building. We're gonna I'm gonna. Uh, Turn over the stage to Jason for a solometer, and we'll keep going. Thank you, Jason. Um, because we have a time constraint, I probably want to uh, accelerate a little bit, um, so can I can save enough time for you guys to do the lab. So in this section, I'm going to quickly go through the solometer, uh, and also, more importantly, the solometer integration with LBAS, and also the solometer integration with heat. So let's do a quick uh, overview. Um, Solometer, at the time when it was originally designed and developed, uh, its purpose is to, uh, for the user to collect the bidding information. Um, its main goal is to provide infrastructure to collect any information for any OpenStack projects. Then later on, uh, later on users start using uh, Solometer for other purposes, like, for example, monitoring. Um, if you want to uh, collect the statistics and use uh, uh, stats to trigger alarm. Uh, Solometer is one of the best fit for you. Uh, for all of these reasons, um, in order to achieve these goals, Solometer, from architecture perspec uh, perspective, can uh, actually is composed of multiple component. So from the left to right, from top to the bottom, you can see that the first one is agent. There's a couple of type of agent. For example, the messaging bus listener agent. And in that case, the, the messaging bus less, uh, listener agent is going to grab the event or, or notification from the messaging bus and transform into the samples. Here in today's workshop, we're going to uh, take a closer look at another type of agent, which is called the polling agent. And in this, in this case, polling agents is going to communicate with other OpenStack projects via API. So when the polling agent grabs the statistics via the API, it's going to hand it over to another key component called the pipeline publisher, uh, the publishing uh, pipeline. So on the receiving side, as a user, you can do a lot of magic on the, on the, on the received samples. For example, you can run through those samples uh, over a cup of transformer and transform into the new meter. And afterwards, it's up to the publisher to send those metering information onto the messaging bus. Right? On the other hand, um, you can have a multiple different type of the receiver. For example, you, as a user, you can write your own script and tap into the messaging bus, grab those raw information from the messenger bus, run through a couple of business logic, and decide what you're going to do with the result. And don't forget that Salamander also provides you with a default receiver service, which is called collector. And in this case, collect, collector retrieve the data and save them into the database or save them into the file. Um, in order to support the interaction between Solometer client and uh, the Solometer system, um, Solometer also provides the API front end. By using the front end API, as a user, you can, you can uh, get the data out of the database or push some policy into the into the database. For example, the alarm definition. 
And since we talk about alarm, uh, let's also take a quick look of this alarm subsystem. And by the definition, alarm defines a couple of things. The first one is which meter you're interested in. The second one is what are the polling interval. And the third one is which condition you're looking for. And the last one is what action you're going to take when those conditions are met. Right? So this is the four key points I want you to remember because we're going to dive into, the, into more details in the later slides. Um, sure, there's so on, but I also have other subsystems, for example, notifi notification. Um, but as you can, you can tell, um, I'm not only running out of the shapes, but I'm, I'm also running out of the room or space on the slides. So I intentionally uh, skipped the notification subsystem. So I, I bet um, most of the audience here already used the uh, load balancer before. And uh, the Neutron LPAS service is not a mystery either. Uh, so today, in, in this workshop, we're not going to spend a lot of time uh, trying to turn you into the LBAS expert. Instead, uh, let's spend our energy behind the solometer and LBAS integration. Does anybody use this uh, command before the, the Neutron LBAS pool stats? This command before? OK. All right, so like I mentioned before, uh, the polling agent actually interact with other OpenStack uh, services via API. And in this case, is a Neutron LBS service. Uh, as a matter of fact, the API communication between the Neutron polling agent and the Neutron LBS service is identical to the API used by the Neutron uh, load balancer pull stats command. So as you can see, this command actually returns you a very well-formatted table uh, capturing a couple of key information. For example, the, the current active uh, con uh, connections being processed by the load balancer pool. Uh, some other information, for example, the total number of bytes coming in and out of the load balancer pool. And the last one is this total connection, which means the total number of connections being processed or has been processed by the load balancer. So also recall that in the, in the architecture slides, um, I mentioned that a polling agent grab all of the stats via the API and put envelope into uh, around, around the stats, turn them into the meter. right? So as, as, as you can see, in the context of uh, Solometer and LBAS integration, the polling agent actually create a couple of meters for you. The first one is this network service uh, load balancer active connections. This is a counterpart of the active connections, as you can see in the, in the table at the top of the, the slides. Uh, another two is uh, load balancer incoming bytes and the load balancer outgoing bytes. This is mapped to the bytes in and the bytes out uh, entry in the, in the first table. The last one actually is the most important one for today's workshop. So let's uh, lay our eyes on the last one. It's called Low Balancer Total Connections. So this one, uh, this is the meter we're going to use later on to, uh, to trigger the alarm. But before we go uh, continue on to that di discussion, let's take a pause. Because you might already notice the meter type of this total connection is is cumulative, and the unit is set to connection. So in other words, the value of this meter can only go to one direction, which is up over the time. So in other words, we cannot directly use this meter for the purpose of triggering alarm. Instead, we need an, another new meter, which can fluctuate over the time up and down. Right. So with that being said, um, also remember that uh, I mentioned previously, by using this publishing pipeline, we can, as a user, we can do a lot of magic on the receiving meters and its samples. So now let's use total connection as an example and see how we can transform those total connections to a new meter, let's say total connection rate. So as a matter of fact, the publishing pipeline gives you a lot of flexibility. This is one, uh, one of the most interesting things I, I find out um, is quite useful for Solometer. Inside this directory, etc Solometer subdirectory, you can find a file called pipeline.yaml file. And this YAML file 
give you the coupling, define the coupling between the source of the samples to its corresponding sync for transmission purpose, and also the publication of the metering information. So if you open up this file, the first thing you notice on the left-hand side is the source. Uh, in this section, you can find a definition of the meter which you are interested in. Another thing is how often are you going to pull this meter. And in the sync section, you can find the, the name of the transformer. In this case, is is a rate of change. And right below, you can find that what do you want to do? You want to map the original meter, which is the total connection, to another one. It's called the total connection dot rate. Here, towards the bottom, you can also see that the um, the type of the meter is not accumulative anymore. Instead, it becomes a uh, gauge. And also, the unit is not a connection anymore. It's a connection per second. At the bottom, uh, in the publisher section, this defines how do you want to publish the new samples for this new meter. And uh, here, we just use the default recommended value, which is notifier. Uh, notifier really means is you want to publish the metering information onto the messaging bus by Oslo Messaging Library. So this is the pipeline. Uh, so by the end, we have a new meter called uh, total connection dot rate. And don't forget that on the, on the other hand, the messaging bus, we also have a, collect, a, a collector service. Collector service retrieve the raw data of the messaging bus and save a copy into the database or into the, the file, which in turn made available for the Solometer API through the Solometer API. So now as a user, uh, if you issue another command, solometer, a sample list command, you can now see all of a sudden this new meter showing up in the output. The type, the unit, and also the, the frequency in terms of timestamp, they are all defined in your pipeline.yaml file. And sure, in this case, because we just started a load balancer, the volume is still uh, 0. We'd use CPU to, to spike these, and it was difficult because when you start hammering the machine with CPU to create an auto scale event, well, you're you're auto scaling what you're already hammering and making the problem worse by adding more machines because you're using a tool to create the CPU. And then I was like, you know, Shoshan, you know, there's this other thing about you know connection, uh, Elbaz connections, but it didn't, like he said, didn't do precisely what we wanted, but he was able to take it. And say, well, let's instead of cumulative connections, let's change that connection, you know, connection rate. Um, and I thought that was pretty, pretty cool. So j it, the call out is that there may be stuff in Solometer that doesn't precisely fit your use case. You may want to know block growth in, in a VM over time versus total block growth, or like rate of change, or something like that. So you can just, um, I say just, he, he's the one who did it, but uh, <laughs> you can just call Shashan, and uh, he can write you a new uh, meter for you. Now. But yes, this is actually one of the uh, beauty I like about Solometer. Um, it's highly customizable. We actually have create our own agent, uh, grab a lot of information not only from the inf uh, not at not only at the infrastructure level uh, level, but also at the application level, and send it over to the to the collector, and then integrate those data into our database. So this is part of our our, our product. Uh, another thing I want to highlight here is, uh, by, by, by default, the polling interval is uh, 600 seconds, which is 10 minutes. Um, I don't believe we have uh, either have a time or patience here to wait for 10 minutes be before you can see the, the new meter come up. So I intentionally trimmed down the, the interval to the, the minimum value, which is 60 seconds. So in your lab, uh, at the time when you go through the lab exercise, I encourage you to issues all of these commands and uh, just try it out by yourself. Um, the, another one is uh, pretty important, in my opinion, is the Solometer uh, statistic you know, command. Uh, here, it gives you the minimum average and also maximum value of the new meters over a certain period of time. All right, um, so now let's talk about alarm, because the heat and the Solometer in integration is heavily rely on alarm. Uh, on this slide, what I'm trying to share with you is how we can manually create a solometer alarm without, without any assistance from the heat. 
So we remember that by definition, alarm need to define a couple of things, right? Um, the number one is which meter you're interested in. The second one is how often you want to evaluate the, the, the meter. And the third one is which condition you're looking for. And the last one is what action you're going to take. So what this command actually tell us is we're going to interest in we're interesting in the meter called low balancer connection dot rate. So this is a new meter we just created by using solometer. We're going to take a very close look, look at this meter, and we're going to evaluate the value of this meter every 60 seconds, every one minute. And the condition here is, is if we saw the case, if we saw the scenario, the average value of this new meter is greater than the predefined threshold, which is 2.0, in the past three consecutive period, then we're going to trigger alarm. And one thing I want to highlight here is it sounds like a lot of tasks, but all, all of the tasks I just mentioned is actually covered by the alarm evaluator. But here, at this moment, we still miss one thing, which is action. Does anybody know what the default action is when alarm is triggered? It's actually do nothing but save the alarm into the log file for debugging purpose. And that particular task is actually handled by alarm, by the alarm and notifier. Right? So here, um, as you can see, uh, also part of your lab, uh, I, I remember I put in, in the lab guide, uh, I encourage you to try the solometer alarm list prior to the integration with, with heat and see what is the outcome of, of this command. So now, let's pull everything together. Uh, I just want to quickly touch upon the solometer and heat integration by single slides, uh, because I already explained all of those principles to you in the previous slides. So recall, remember that uh, the major, the main goal, the main goal of heat as an orchestrator is try to avoid all of this tedious task for you as a user by automation. So in other words, what I shared with you in the previous slides, uh, that uh, the alarm thresh threshold create command, you can, you can just forget about it. Right? You don't have to remember all of the syntax parameters, what it really mean, because heat is going to automatically provision the alarm definition for you via the solometer API. However, I still wanted to remember the principle, the concept like the definition of this new meters, the how often we're going to put it, and also what condition we're looking for together with action. Right? Because at the time we go through the lab exercise, all of the concepts, all of the, all of this parameter, you actually need to define it as part of the heat hot template. You still you still need to do it as part of the hot template. And at the same time, I want to uh, point out two things. The first one is by using the heat template, uh, one of the key difference is heat is actually going to create a two alarm definition for you. The first one captures a scenario or the cases when the value is greater than the predefined threshold. Uh, the second alarm defined another scenario when the average value actually go below the threshold. So by using these two alarms, the heat can get a not notification from the alarm notifier and use this uh, information to decide what I need to scale up by adding more VM instance in the load balancer pool, or I need to scale down by, el by el eliminating a VM instance from the load balancer pool. So this is the first key difference I wanted to remember. The second one is. Um, in the previous slides, I talked about the default action you're going to take uh, if you want to manually create the uh, solarmet alarm definition. In that case, it's log, right? You log your alarm into the log file. But by using the heat uh, template, the, def the action is going to change. It's going to change to another type of action, which is called HTTP callback. In other words, the heat is going to tell the so solometer notifier a predefined URL. And when alarm is set off, the uh, solometer notifier is, is going to make a HTTP request to that URL, 
containing all of those details, why this alarm is triggered. So this is the last slide of my section. Is there any um, questions I can help you with? I have a quick question. Sure. Can you talk about connections for a second? Yeah. Uh, so is, it, is there application specific? No. Uh, well, in our, in our case, we use HTTP because we try to simulate uh, uh, the web server farm. Um, but in general, load balancer, there's no restriction what load balancer can uh, proxy, right? So it can be anything. Yes, you're absolutely right. So, but that zip uh, is tied to some application port. That is correct. So, and that connection per second threshold can vary as far as what application Exactly, is. yeah. In our lab, actually, I intentionally set to two, uh, very, which is very low number. Uh, in other words, uh, when you go through the lab, ex lab exercise, there's a one partic particular step. Uh, I'm going to ask you to use uh, Apache benchmarking two to generate uh, the HTTP request towards the web, as you mentioned. In that case, very quickly, you're going to see the, the values go up, you know, up through the shelf, and which in turn trigger the alarm. Um, any other questions before I turn the floor to Charmaine? All right, thank you very much. You get up. Thanks, Isha. So, so I'm going to cover uh, uh, concepts around heat uh, from the basics right to the, the more advanced uh, features that heat provides with auto scaling. Um, so, moving on to, I think, so all the conceptual information that we will be covering today will be in, in, in the context of the lab exercises, just in the interest of time. So, I'm going to probably quickly run through all the terms that are used in heat. Uh, so to start with, uh, uh, we have the notion of uh, a resource, and resource is one of the most fundamental blocks in, uh, in uh, heat uh, terminology. And um, uh, a resource can be anything. It could be a virtual machine. It could be a network, a port, a security group, uh, a subnet. Uh, and um, all the orchestration happens around a resource in, in, in OpenStack heat. Now, um, the other, the, the other important term is uh, really uh, a stack. And a stack is nothing but um, uh, an instantiated form of a resource. And nothing but a collection of, uh, of or a composition of those instances uh, form a, a, a stack in, in the runtime terminology of heat. Now, a template, on the other hand, is just like a specification that, uh, that you use to compose these resources together. Um, and then you have uh, parameters that are nothing but configurable input variables. Uh, you can configure them either through CLIs or you can uh, default these within uh, your template as well. And you've, of course, it, parameters have types and descriptions. The, the other important uh, aspect for um, uh, heat is the output section. And uh, the labs don't cover the output section. They, uh, the, the docs generally say, um, oh, it's for you know, uh, displaying the output of the heat uh, uh, runtime uh, uh, command, but in, in reality, the output section can be actually used to configure attributes, and those attributes can be used in subsequent nested templates. We haven't included that lab exercise, but I want to call out that the output section does have some merit to it when you use it appropriately with the get attributes uh, functions. Um, so we, we walk through the resources, we walk through what a, what a stack is, a runtime instance of a compos composition of resources, uh, what a template is. Uh, so the very first lab exercise, uh, it's a very simple uh, virtual machine, a simple server. Uh, it spawns a VM. It'll inject an SSH key. It will uh, uh, create a uh, port, uh, apply security groups uh, to the port, associate a floating IP, and uh, install um, a small uh, uh, a Netcat, utility, Net Netcat utility just to simulate HTTP res request response scenarios. Uh, so that's pretty much your first lab exercise. Moving on to the next lab exercise, uh, this is uh, a template that's solely focused on, um, 
on uh, load balancer resources, uh, on all the neutron resources that get created as a result of instantiating a load balancer. So the only parameters, uh, so this section is probably highlighting only sections that we are talking about right now. So the parameters that go into this uh, heat template are, are the floating external floating network, which will really serve as the final whip that you will hit against. Uh, it uh, takes in also an internal subnet, because that's where you'll create your internal pool uh, against. Um, it creates, the, in terms of resources, it'll actually go ahead and create the health monitor. And uh, it creates a pool. So remind you, right now, this is an empty pool. So it creates a pool uh, over HTTP with a policy of round robin. Uh, it creates a whip as well. So this particular resource block not only creates a pool, it creates a whip against the internal subnet. Uh, you create a load balancer resource and associate with a, with a pool in the next resource. And then, of course, you have the floating IP against uh, the external network, and then association of the floating IP against the WIP that we created in uh, the previous uh, 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 neutron pool uh, resource. So when you run a heat stack on, on this template, what typically what you should see is uh, an empty load balancer pool here. So you should make sure the state is up and the health monitor status is in active state. Um, it's uh, right now we see, uh, if you notice, the members are empty right now. We haven't added any VMs. There are no uh, IPs uh, associated to this pool yet uh, for the backend configuration. Uh, so um, I apologize. I forgot to mention we are using uh, HA proxy here, which is the default plugin for load balancer right now. So uh, this is an HA proxy uh, setup for uh, your dev stack installations. So if you notice, the VIP now uh, is associated with the external floating IP. Uh, when you do a floating IP list against uh, the internal WIP. And uh, at the end of this lab exercise, you should be able to hit the, uh, the floating IP. And you should get a 503 service not available, which is uh, a valid scenario because you don't have any backend servers connected to the front end WIP at this point. So part two of uh, the lab exercise two is now to add the members. Now, uh, one thing to note here is that the web server uh, YAML, and uh, mind you, I've just put snippets of what's relevant to our conversation right now. The web server YAML is exactly the same as uh, it would have uh, been configured for simple server with the addition of the pool ID that we created in the previous uh, uh, exercise uh, for the internal subnet. And you have the uh, association in the resource section of this web server template you will additionally have the uh, association of the member. So if you see here, notice the VM instance first address takes in the uh, uh, IP address of the VM and of the, uh, yeah, of the instantiated VM and associates it with the pool as a member of the pool. Uh, the load balance, uh, so there are some other concepts that we could probably going to introduce you uh, to along the way. Uh, the, so there is this notion of uh, resource groups in, um, in um, uh, Ice House that was introduced part of Ice House. And resource group is nothing but uh, identically configured resources. Not identical resources, but identically configured resources that can be clubbed together. And the, the use case here that we're trying to demonstrate is that we are saying that we are going to add um, uh, uh, the X number of um, uh, uh, capacity to uh, load balance a pool. And that's what we are trying to do here in the capacity count. We're saying by default, uh, you know, launch this uh, resource pool with uh, two members uh, and associate them to uh, the load balancer that we configured in the previous exercise. So that is all this is that is doing here. We also introduced the notion of nested resources. And um, there are different ways of uh, nesting templates uh, from an optimi optimization perspective or composition perspective. And in this case, we are using um, the environments.yaml uh, and uh, through the resource registry definition here that you're seeing. And we are saying this is a provider resource. So the web server.yaml is really a provider resource that is aliased to uh, a custom declaration of a resource in uh, the environments file, which is uh, scaled. And we're just referencing that scale back into the resource definition of the members YAML. Uh, oops, sorry. So yeah, if you see here, that's that's the reference to the scaled uh, alias. And if you were to the, the manner in which you would launch this particular heat template is that you would just say heat stack create a load member stack, which is uh, what will actually launch the the uh, members of that resource group, 
and you would provide um, the ca capacity count here in this case. And that's the only difference between the previous exercise versus uh, the web server load balancer. At the end of this exercise, you should be able to uh, uh, effectively hit the, the, the external width uh, and get you know, an alternate IP from the uh, local instances uh, uh, internal subnet uh, that was configured for that VM. So basically, that will tell you that your Robin policy is in place, and both the VMs are responding in that fashion. Uh, the, the last exercise is, uh, is uh, focused on auto scaling. Now, auto scaling basically is is, is another uh, addition that was added in, in Ice House, and it, it primarily tells you an, that you can scale uh, up and down an arbitrary number of resources. Um, it uh, it uses several um, uh, parameters and properties that you can configure on the load balancer. You can, uh, the max size or the minimum size, uh, a cool down policy, and then we'll see in the lab exercise how these uh, come into play. A cool down policy will wait until it actually goes ahead and performs a certain action. Um, again, we're using the same scale resource uh, reference. Uh, so Shishong probably po pointed out in his uh, section where he, he was manually creating all those alarms uh, and the meters. In, in this case, uh, the, you would, as a prerequisite, you would re require to load the pipeline, the custom uh, meter pipeline for uh, load balance the total connections. But you don't have to really go ahead and manually create those, uh, those alarms. Uh, so in, 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 our, in, the, in lab three, we have created actually two alarms. Uh, I'm just for the purpose of this slide, I'm just showing you one alarm here, but there are two alarms that are configured. One is the rate high alarm and one is the rate low command uh, alarm. So in, in the rate uh, high alarm, uh, basically what it does is that it, it, it has configured a threshold of two, which means that if um, the connections uh, rate, the, conne the, the rate of connection per second uh, goes, crosses the threshold of two, uh, for two consecutive evaluation periods, I'm sorry, three consecutive evaluation periods, and each period being a duration of 60 seconds, which, which essentially means after a consecutive period of 180 seconds, if you're seeing um, a threshold of connections per second crossing three, then the alarm action says that, um, it, it raises an alarm, and the action says that go ahead and execute the scale-up policy. And in the, in the scale-up policy, we are, uh, all we are doing here is we are saying uh, the adjustment is a change in capacity. And, and what do I want to do? I want to scale it up by one. So if, if the, com the comparison operator says yeah, it's greater than two, then go ahead and change the capacity to, to scale it up by one, in which case, you should, when you do a NOAA list, you should start seeing a VM getting booted up. So that's pretty much the auto-scaling exercise. Uh, some of the enhancements in Ice House and beyond, just wanted to highlight, um, there was the introduction of resource groups. Uh, there, were, there was introduction of provider resources. And these are all, all um, enhancements that were done from the point of optimizing um, the, the manner in which you could effectively use heat in many different use cases. Uh, config resource was, was another one uh, added. Config resource is typically used in conjunction with com uh, software deploy. Uh, against a target, which is really a, a server. Um, the Kilo actually introduced a very interesting um, a blueprint for s snapshotting an entire stack, which means not only uh, would your resources be at that point in time, including your volume, your networks, everything would be at a point in time, and you could actually roll back to that. Uh, in terms of improvements to the authentication model, so this was a big issue in, in Grizzly for, in case those of you ever work with Keystone and Grizzly, and specifically with some of the uh, cloud formation um, signals. So, so some, of the, some of the actions in heat require uh, resource creation, of course, and consequently sometimes admin roles. And this, the owner or the creator of the stack had to actually be an admin user, which is not, which is not an optimal security model. So uh, in, uh, in starting Ice House, uh, uh, and actually, in June, they introduced the notion of uh, a heat keystone domain. So they leveraged the keystone domain uh, feature of, uh, in Keystone and created a separate domain for heat, wherein all the, all the uh, users that get dynamically created for heat are within confined to that heat domain, and it is managed by uh, the heat admin domain user uh, or role. Now, in, in regular OpenStack installations, you will need to actually go ahead and configure this manually. You'll have to create a domain, and you'll have to add the uh, heat uh, admin, give it the admin role. Uh, but in your DevStack, configuration is automatically pre-configured by DevStack, so you don't have to do that. Uh, this, again, requires a Keystone version 3, so that's important to note. Uh, so right now, Triple O heat templates are available. Uh, Triple O is trying to do something uh, 
uh, like an overcloud. So basically, they start off with the notion that I'm building a small uh, contained cloud, which is like the under cloud that's going to go ahead and build larger, uh, large scale op uh, OpenStack clouds for me on uh, as uh, as my target use cases. So um, over cloud is um, is heavily being used right now, and it is leveraging a bunch of these features like resource groups and provider groups, as software config and deploy resources. There's also a software component deploy, and uh, so basically config will allow you to run a bash script or you know a puppet manifest, but a uh, component will give you more uh, uh, more of a key value mapping, so you'll have more control on how you. Uh, produce the configurations. Uh, that's pretty much in all we have for the enhancements. So uh, that covers uh, most of our heat exercises uh, for today. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Uh, so if you, if you actually ended up doing a, key, uh, a key, Keystone user list, you would actually see those generated Keystone users. It's not the resource that generates users. It's the requirement that a, a Heat API has uh, to be able to go ahead and create those resources that it create, creates these users for you. Yeah. All right. So as we build out the lab, we can probably uh, get more pointed questions at this point. Uh, let me turn it back to you, Jason. Thank you. Uh, GitHub. Uh, yeah. I apologize, we may not have enough time to finish the entire lab exercise today, but I do want to uh, show you the pointer to our lab guide because uh, you already have the environment on your laptop, hopefully by this moment. And later on, if you go to GitHub, we share all of those presentations, the images, and also the lab guide. You can still follow the lab guide and do the exercise, you know, you from your home. Drive. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so this is the, the lab guide I, I created based on uh, by using page. Um, so I still, surely, still have some room for improvement. Um, but I, I just want to use this opportunity to quickly go through this lab guide with you. This lab guide have uh, quite a few major sections. Uh, first one is the lab in environmental setup. I believe uh, Jason slides probably uh, does a better job than me. Uh, please use his slides as a reference right, to understand uh, the, the lab environment and also the, 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 the topology. Yeah, if, you, if you go out there now, you'll see two different guides, one for the environment build, which was done separately because of the bandwidth thing. But by the time you get back, the, this 1.4 will have the build from Vagrant from scratch, uh, as well as the, the labs. So yeah. keep going. And also, as Charming just pointed out, there's some three major labs captured by this lab guide. The first one, by the end of the, the lab one, you're, you're going to use a heat template to create a very simple uh, uh, web server. I mean, even if the web server itself, uh, well, so it's a VM, the virtual machine, right? In this case, there's nothing fancy, just help you to understand the layout of the heat template, those syntax, those concepts Charming just shared with you. The lab two actually have a two parts, but by the end of the lab two, you should be able to uh, create a load balancer with a multiple, a multiple web server in the, in the pool. And uh, by the end of the lab three, you should be able to rely on the heat template to automatically scale up and uh, scale down. And also, men as I mentioned, I also put uh, a small tube built into the, the image. Uh, is Apache benchmark uh, benchmarking too. You can use that too to generate, to pump a lot of HTTP traffic into the low balancer web. Uh, here, across all of the sections, uh, we laid out step-by-step -step procedures to help you stay on the right track. Uh, what is the command you need to use to verify and validate your environment? And for example, what is the prompt you expect yourself to be in at each steps, and also what are the command you should use for, verifi for verifi verification purpose. 
Um, and we also spend a lot of time trying to add additional information for you. For example, the tips, right? Because uh, some steps over there we intentionally added as a trick question. Um, if you, for example, in this case, if you um, <laughs> if you create a, a low balancer and and do the low balancer pool list, you won't see anything because uh, at this moment there is no pool member yet. So this is kind of tips we added to help you, or actually to keep you thinking. And the time when you go through the, the lab, and we try this out with some other audience, then they, they like all of this layout uh, very much. Um, and again, um, this is a sharing session. We're not trying to sell anything. But instead, we really encourage you to go through this lab exercise whenever you have a free cycle. And one very important thing, we also want to hear your feedback. We are here to solicit it, your feedback. So next time, we're making a chance to offer the same workshop. We have a better material for our audience. Do you have anything? Else you want to add? I think we have time to try a demo if you want. So we, we have a we have a pre-configured VM running, and uh, you can uh, probably just fire off and do some normal list commands and show them. Mine's stuff mine's or one of my machines. Or we can we can probably troubleshoot. Too. Mm -hmm. uh, that's fine. Yeah, you have one in. Mine is down right now. So you, want, you can. It doesn't take long to. Yeah, we we'll can bring it up. Yeah. Or mine. Uh, you can do it from base, right? Or we can do it from base. I got the YAML in there. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, sure, or you can use mine. Yeah, let's everything. do it. OK, all right. So what we're going to do, I know, so I thought third time was a charm. We had problems the, f the first time we did. We ran out of bandwidth on the hosted environment. Second time, we brought in all these machines, and that fell over as there's too many people. Third time, I thought, well, everyone's just going to build their own, and we'll do that. But I think that was not awesome either. So. Um, I don't know how many people have machines up. You can take the lab guide and, okay. So everyone circle around these guys here. No, um, well, um, like you said, you can use the lab guide and go through all this. What we're going to do is show you in the last few minutes that we have um, what it looks like. So you can see an auto-scaling event um, and see the traffic going in and stuff like that. So he's, bring, he's bringing that up. And so the folks that started with a Vagrant up? Was it a bandwidth thing, or did stuff just time out? Yeah. Yeah. So, still going? Well, it's persistent, anyway. <laughs> um, so, I, just, I don't know what the uh, answer is. Maybe more, okay, so it's more of everything. So, if you have uh, more servers local to, to host. But what you're going to see in the, in the demo, like you said, like we've been talking about, essentially, um, at the end of the Vagrant, what it does is it, it creates some load balancers and some VIPs and floating IPs, but just to test, just, just a sanity check, right? And it del deletes all that. Um, the lab starts, and you take uh, a basic heat template, and it builds uh, a few server environment. Um, you add on to that exercise with adding some load balancers, and then by the third one, it's the autoscale template. And what that brings all the components together, heat, solometer, LBAS, Nova, uh, all together, and then you, we take the Apache Bench tool and we start hitting it. The custom meter that he wrote um, counts the connections. That exceeds, uh, triggers, it starts bringing machines up, um, and then we turn the bench off. So it's actually kind of anticlimactic after you've built everything. It's like, look, machines are popping up, and then they're not, <laughs> you know, but um, it, it works, so we're gonna try and get a demo out in the last uh, six minutes so you know what the expected results uh, should be like. I'll see if my uh, vagrant finished. So, okay, well here's, here's, um, here's something actually. The, the vagrant file, my vagrant file finished, right? And um, if you vagrant SSH into the box, um, before I do that, actually, you can uh, you can actually cat the vagrant file and see some of the stuff that it's doing at the end. Um, waiting on these guys. At the end of the vagrant vagrant file, there's there's just a shell script section, and it's going in. You know, after the file runs, and it's and it's um, creating rules and adding DNS to subnets. It's creating a, a custom instance. 
uh, creates a little bit. So you have all the commands there, right there for you in the Vagrant file if you want to if you want to do this kind of stuff yourself. Um, also, it might be interesting to see. The first thing it does when it completes is it tells a time check. So this is the end of the Vagrant file that that on a successful run, and it does a lot of stuff. I was. Any good, uh, so an hour and 16 minutes. It should take about 20 minutes to, for the Vagrant thing to build, so this took an hour and 16 minutes. But um, just like any good in, in, in engineering and innovation, this came out of pure laziness. Um, you know, having to build an environment, then add rules, add security groups, add networks, name them, um, and uh, add DNS, add images, all that stuff. This is, this is all the stuff that's in the end of that file um, that you can reuse, it's in the lab. So anyway, the... You'll see here, I'm just going to grab that, and you just vagrant SSH into your environment. And I did nothing special here um, except do a vagrant up. So um, this last little stanza tests the VIPs. Um, so um, it creates it. So one thing we didn't cover, that the interesting thing about the load balancer is you don't, contrary to popular belief probably, you think you put your load balancer on your public I, public subnet, but you don't. The the load balancer typically resides on the same subnet as your VMs. Then you attach a floating IP to the the load balancer VIP. Um, and what this was just doing now is just connecting to um, the internal and the external VIP. And you'll see here, and when it connects, so it's connecting to the VIP every time. It's it's hitting this IP every time, which is the the public VIP. And what's returning is you know it's going one two three one two three one two three just like a load balancer should, right? Um, and when you, assuming you have the machine running and everything working, you should be able to go to 33.2 uh, and get a login. I think we're going to run out of time on the demo, but um, I don't know what it's doing on that first login. It does come up. It just takes a minute. The people who use the from scratch environment, did it come up clean or did you have to do anything extra? The rejoin, right? That was on the image or on the boot from scratch? Okay, yeah. The okay. I would give it another shot, so the same file, it's just vag it's just not vagrant, but, but the connection. Um, yeah, anytime you reboot, so any dev stack machine that you reboot, you always have to run rejoin. Um, and also, if you're rebooting this and it doesn't come up, and you're like, ah, oh, nothing works, it's, you know, um, just Rabbit has a problem auto starting for some reason too. So try rejoin. If that doesn't work, try, try Rabbit as well. Um, but I really uh, appreciate your interest, especially all the folks that came early. I'm sorry there wasn't enough room. Sorry we didn't have enough bandwidth. We really tried to do the local machine thing and it just didn't uh, pan out for us. But this is, I mean, this is not our day job at our jobs. This is just stuff because we're just that dorky um, and really like it. So send us uh, an email. We're building environments and, and doing, you know, this kind of stuff uh, all the time. I want you to take away something uh, interesting. So you know, just let us know if you want extra help, and I'll I'll help you out. Running it on VMware Fusion, I've done too. If you do that, so um. well, okay. What's that? Yes. Um, it is in the deck, but it's J A S G R I M M, like Jason Grimm, uh, at Cisco.com. Guys, do you have, uh, we, we, we ran out of time on the demo as well, but do you have anything else to add? Yeah, yeah I think, I think go, go do, do try out the, the exercises on GitHub, um, download the, the Vagrant uh, script and uh, try to bring it up. Uh, it, it, you should be able to get the lab exercising up and running. Uh, and uh, yeah, feel free to reach out if you have any feedback or if you have any questions or something's not still working well for you. Uh, 
time permitting, we will try to make sure it uh, runs successfully. Thank you, Thank you for your time. Thank you.